Bikepacking is a powerful drug that transports you to different places. A funny thing happens with time. It compresses and expands. Some moments in time are woven into the deepest memories, while other memories are gone as quickly as they arrived. Spiraling pits of despair can make two hours feel like eight, and natural hits of adrenaline and dopamine can make eight hours feel like two. This manipulation of time with endurance sports is fascinating to me. We all do this for different reasons. I love to race. There is bonding through struggle and overcoming the unknown both physically and psychologically. But there's something different here, on trips like these, something deeper. What exists here is at the core of being a tribal human. Exploration, camaraderie, and accomplishment together. This is what we were put on this planet to do. There is no drug that even comes close to this. This route was designed and published by Kurt Ruffsnyder, who is in my opinion, the greatest ultra endurance mountain biker that has ever lived, the GOAT. He runs bikepackingroots.org, which is currently the only nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting bikepacking and bikepackers. Go check it out and support what he's doing there if you can. This route is 177 miles with about 11,000 feet of climbing, and we opted to split it into three days and two nights. The approach to this group ride was simple, and our goal was to eliminate the pressure to stay together while also keeping the camaraderie of a party pace ride. So we opted for a pseudo self-supported bikepacking stage ride with predetermined campsites and a prearranged cooler drop for a resupply at mile 111. The distances between stages were fairly evenly distributed, so the faster riders could take some of the side trip opportunities to various points of interest and lookout points, while the slower riders had plenty of time to not feel hurried to keep up or ride outside of their comfort zones. The route follows forest roads and two track as it weaves through some of the most stunning volcanic landscapes in Northern Arizona. We got our permits, filled our resupply cooler with goodies, and kicked off this adventure. There is always a palatable excitement in the air just before I start a bikepacking ride. Even a casual group ride like this is a mix of excitement, anticipation, and nerves. I met up with my friends Tyler and Chris at one of Flagstaff's most iconic breakfast places, Mike and Rhonda's The Place and we all filled our bellies with huge, greasy breakfast burritos. I ordered one for the road and we packed up, started our trackers, and rolled out of town. We met up with a Flagstaff newcomer and one of Chris's friends, Jimmy, at the start of the Observatory Mesa climb. His plan was to ride with us a while and do some exploring, but save the bikepacking for a different day. I huffed up the steep grade and the ground became increasingly tacky from the off and on morning rain. One more hour of rain and this would have been death mud. We felt lucky to be rolling smoothly on the network of urban trails and grade A forest roads. The San Francisco peaks were socked in with clouds, but still provided some amazing views. The San Francisco peaks are the eroded remains of a single, once much higher, stratovolcano called the San Francisco Mountain. The SFM volcanic cone was constructed by multiple eruptions between 900,000 and 400,000 years ago. It now contains the six highest individual peaks in Arizona, with the tallest, Humphreys Peak, at 12,637 feet. We continued to head north through the clean corridors of ponderosa pine trees, and soon the equally impressive Kendrick Mountain inched closer. Kendrick Peak rises to the height of 10,425 feet, which makes it the 11th tallest summit in Arizona. Kendrick Peak is a lava dome between 2.7 and 1.4 million years old. A quick detour brought me to the stunning and always popular Lava River Cave. This mile-long lava tube cave was formed roughly 700,000 years ago by molten rock that erupted from a volcanic vent in nearby Hart Prairie. The top, sides, and bottom of the flow cooled and solidified first, after which the insides of the lava river continued to flow, emptying out the present cave. If you ever do this route, don't pass up on this ultra-cool experience. We passed active ranches and U.S. Forest Service cabins for rent as we ascended the real Schultz Pass. It continued to drizzle as I heard elk bugling in the distance and the surrounding landscape felt very Pacific Northwest in that moment. So cool. 
A quick pedal on Historic Route 66 tarmac brought us over the interstate and back on gravel to our lunch destination. With my belly full once again, we headed west and closed in on Williams. There are moments you get bikepacking that you just don't get anywhere else. You're moving at a slow enough pace to enjoy things you may not have seen if driving in a car. And you're covering enough ground that there are endless opportunities for unique experiences. Bikepackers look non-threatening, and people have a tendency to stop and talk to you, which usually leads to some pretty unique conversations. I found I have a tendency to saturate back into the landscape as an observer. You just don't get this from trail running, walled off in a car, or driving an obnoxious, dusty, loud side-by-side. -side. Chris, Tyler, and I all reconnected and watched in awe as the hundreds of sheep roamed the countryside. There were three working dogs and a shepherd keeping them contained in the field. Talk about primal. This is what these dogs were bred to do, and they were loving every minute of it. The herd started to cross the busy road right in front of us, and one dog circled back behind us and ushered them back to safety. What a magical moment this was between friends. Tarmac carried us into Williams for a junk food resupply at good old reliable Circle K. Then we hit up what appeared to be a closed Pizza Hut, but was in fact fully open and operating. We ordered curbside carryout and Chris discovered Pizza Hut melts, which we all partook. 1100 calories for $6.99. It's hard to beat that. Much more on this discovery and unofficial renaming later. Rolled up on Pizza Hut. Open sign is not illuminated. That does not matter when it comes to Pizza Hut. It doesn't matter if the parking lot looks like it hasn't been maintained or there's trash everywhere. They're open and you can get a good deal. Just <laughs> check them out. We meandered northeast. Tyler nerded out at the small but active Williams Airport and soon we hit dirt once again and watched our shadows appear and disappear with the rolling ominous storm clouds. Chunky two-track roads led us to expansive open fields. My friend Dana affectionately calls this local landscape Flagstaffrica. If you hit it at the right time of day, you'll even see herds of pronghorn deer. 76 miles into the route, we reached our destination campsite, nestled back in the pine trees. Woo! It'll do. So cozy. There's Chris's setup, nice. Oh, this is a different tent. Yep. It's only the second time I've used it. Cool. It's our tent moment. Oh. Cool. Two stakes. Whoa. I think yeah. I did very close to my max miles that I've ever done before. They were easier than my other my other day doing that though. Good scenery, good company. It was super fun. Starting with breakfast, meeting with Jimmy. It was a whole adventure today. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Well tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be a little more challenging. Yep. I would rate today's ride a solid 8.25 out of 10. Cadillac gravel. Uh, for the most part, good weather as far as not a lot of sun. Uh, very nice, fast gravel with uh, just a touch of uh, Pizza Hut. <sighs> <laughs> Good morning. Here's the view from inside my shelter. pretty cozy. Morning came and I stared at the dew on the inside of my tarp. I laid awake and pondered how long it would take for the sun to shine and dry things out. It was way more wet and cold than I expected. I shimmied out of my bivy and asked Chris, how cold do you Ooh. think it is right now? And his response was, warmer than it feels wet. because of the wet. Chris packed up quickly and hit the road ahead of Tyler and I. His years of backpacking really pay off and this wasn't his first wet pack up rodeo. I made it a few miles down the road and took a quick detour to take in some morning sun, warm up, and have a quick yard sale to prepare for the day. Tyler and I turned and started heading east out of the high desert and back into the pine trees. The group began to separate, and this part of the route was full of slow climbs, very chunky two-track, and old abandoned ranch houses. Well, I just broke a spoke. Good times. 
I opted to take the side trip up to Red Mountain Lookout. Red Mountain is a volcanic cinder cone that rises a thousand feet above the surrounding landscape. It is unusual in having the shape of a U and in lacking the symmetrical shape of most cinder cones. In addition, a large natural amphitheater cuts into the cone's northeast flank. Erosional pillars, called hoodoos, decorate the amphitheater, and many dark mineral crystals erode out of its walls. There were epic 360 degree views at the top, and I figured it's a great place to have my lunch. So I pulled out my Pizza Hut Melts, which Chris had officially renamed to Sodium Triangles, and dug in. Okay, again, this is why pizza is the greatest food ever made for bikepacking, ever, in the history of ever. Look at that. Amazing. A quick descent gave my legs a much needed break. Then I pedaled on to one of the high points on the route, just about at 8,000 feet, crossing east on the north side of Kendrick Peak through Slate Mountain. Whoa, that climb caught me off guard. That was like never ending. Back on some sweet forest roads. I think Tyler and Chris are both ahead of me, judging from the tire tracks. Mm. Hard to sleep with those things. Buzzing up a storm. I reunited with Chris at the top of the climb and we descended together to our next waypoint, the strategic resupply cooler we had stashed. There better be a Tyler over there. Oh, hey. You're taking no prisoners today. <laughs> it was noon when we hit the cooler and our next pre-range campsite was only four miles away. So the three of us had a parlay and opted to head it on to at least SP Crater at mile 133. With our backpacks full of water and stuffed with snacks, we continued together through my second favorite part on this route, crossing Babbitt Ranch. These ranch lands have huge open treeless vistas with fantastic views of Kendrick, the San Francisco peaks, and numerous other craters and center cones. SP Crater loomed off in the distance like Mordor, and the afternoon sun really started to set in. SP Crater is a striking feature on the local landscape with a very visible lava flow that extends for 4.3 miles to the north. American astronauts use the crater to train for moonwalking. The naming of the mountain is a bit of lore from the Old West. C.J. Babbitt, an 1880s rancher and early landowner of the mountain, expressed his opinion that the mountain resembled a spilled chamber pot, or shit pot, SP and locally this became the accepted name. Map makers refused to spell out the full name, and the mountain has been shown on maps and other literature with the abbreviated name. Not a campsite was to be found for miles, only ant hills and ankle-high sticker bushes. This harsh landscape is home to many golden eagles as it acts as a preserve, and is only accessible during certain times of the year. We finally got relief from the sun as it dipped behind the cinder cones to our right. We were all running out of energy and ready to find camp, and luckily found a clearing down a side service road. No rain tonight. The night sky was stunning. I cowboy camped and watched the 20 or so Starlink satellites run a perfect line across the night sky as I dozed off. Good morning, third morning. It's a beautiful morning out here. We can see O'Leary Peak off in the distance. Humphreys up to the right. It's kind of hidden behind this mountain here. Day three transported me to a different place. The burn scar, the smooth cinder hills, the black cinder roads, the red growth sprouting up from the destruction. This felt like I was riding through the set of some distant planet in a Star Wars movie. I was so awestruck, I didn't even mind the beach sand-like trudging hike a bike. The Cinder Road, as it's called on the map, is a five mile ascent that sneaks around the east side of O'Leary Peak and brings you in the back door of Sunset Crater Volcano National Monument. This was yet another magical moment. Sunset Crater is one of the most recent volcanic features in the Flagstaff area. 
It erupted around a thousand years ago, so between 1040 and 1100 AD, and the lava flows and the cinder cones from this eruption are well preserved. The eruption left behind a stark landscape of black lava and colorful cinders, which is now protected as a national monument. Tyler opted to continue on and I made a brief water stop at the visitor center and gathered my wits before starting the next side trip climb up to the O'Leary Peak Lookout Fire Tower. Four miles, 2,000 feet, and a 13.2% average grade. This climb was no joke on three-day-old tired bikepacking legs. One more switch back left. This is a tough ass climb. But the vast views from the top were worth every drop of sweat. Now this route normally crosses the highway, then makes a stiff climb up to Lockett Meadow, then up Waterline Road. But due to a recent fire and subsequent flooding, this area was closed and we routed up Schultz Pass via a smooth gravel road instead. I was happy to see Chris off in the distance as I caught back up with him and we finished the climb together. Some closing thoughts on this route. I think it was a excellent route. Uh, I wanna thank Chris and Tyler for going through it together. It was a great uh, way that we did it with the go at your own pace during the day and come back together for camp at night. It was really a lot of fun to have that camaraderie, but also kind of that like solo bikepacking kind of feel. And shout out to Kurt Ruff Snyder for making this route. It is epic. This is my home. It's always interesting to see your home from a different perspective. We're literally surrounded by volcanoes and cinders and volcanic activity and it's just absolutely incredible and this route really illustrates that whole whole thing as time exponentially slips by for me my beard grays and i reflect on my bikepacking adventures I'm humbled by the scale and magnificence of the landscapes all around me. I'm reminded that we only get one opportunity to give this life a go. Time is fleeting, and it can't be wasted. A person's attention is now a commodity, and this world is competing for it. I don't want my attention co-opted by big business and unimportant minutia. I want to spend my life laughing with friends and loved ones, adventuring, and doing difficult things. This is what the bikepacking drug provides for me. <laughs> Chris, I'd like you to tell me your favorite part on this whole trip. The true highlight for me was the sodium triangles at Pizza Hut, by far. 11, yeah, $6.99 or, or I think uh, $8.50 with the 20 ounce Pepsi. 1,100 calories and all the sodium you need for the day. How can you beat that? It takes us like north and east, back to Flagstaff kind of. Oh yeah, I didn't. What's it gonna be? Looks like a big bunch of anticlimacticness. Well, we're at the top of. Hey, my helmet's not even hooked. How long has that been like that? Stupid. Real safe, Dylan.